From the shocking courtroom shooting of Klaus Grabowski, the child molester who met his end at the hands of the mother of his victim, to the dramatic suicide of Slobodan Praljak, who defiantly ingested poison in a desperate rejection of his war crimes conviction, and the brutal assassination of Jitenda Gogi by his gangster rivals in a courtroom ambush, these serial killers met their violent ends in the very places meant to deliver justice for their heinous acts. Let's begin with... Klaus Grabowski Klaus Grabowski, a 62-year-old convicted child molester, was on trial for the brutal murder of 7-year-old Anna Bachmeier. The details of the crime were horrifying. Anna had been abducted, molested, and strangled by Grabowski, a man with a long history of sexual offences. Anna's mother, Marianne Bachmeier, was a constant presence in the courtroom. Her face was a mask of sorrow and determination as she listened to the gruesome details of her daughter's last moments. Marianne's pain was palpable, and it resonated with everyone present. The trial was not just about seeking justice for Anna, it was about confronting the evil that had taken her life. As the trial progressed, Grabowski's demeanor remained cold and unrepentant. He showed no remorse for his actions, and his lack of empathy only fueled the anger of those in the courtroom. The tension was thick, and it seemed as though the very walls were closing in on the accused. Marianne sat in the front row, her eyes fixed on the man who had taken her daughter from her. Her grief had turned into a burning rage, and she could no longer contain it. In a moment that would forever be remembered, Marianne stood up, reached into her bag, and pulled out a small caliber pistol. Without a word, Marianne aimed the gun at Grabowski and fired seven shots in rapid succession. The sound of gunfire echoed through the room, and chaos erupted as people scrambled for cover. Grabowski fell to the ground, his body riddled with bullets. The man who had caused so much pain and suffering was now lifeless on the courtroom floor. Hell really hath no fury like a woman scorned. Although this mother was sentenced to six years in prison, she has passed a worthy judgment on the man who took the life of her little girl. This next case is one that would blow your mind. Jitenda Goji on September 24, 2021, the Rohini court in Delhi became the epicenter of a meticulously planned assassination that left everyone in disbelief. Jitenda Gogi, a notorious gangster, was escorted to court number 207 on the second floor of the complex. Gogi, who was in Tihar jail, was brought in by 10 personnel of the 3rd Battalion, Delhi Police. To ensure maximum security, 15 to 20 plainclothes officers from the special cell and Rohini district police were also present. As Judge Gagandeep Singh presided over the courtroom, two men, disguised as lawyers, sat quietly on chairs. Suddenly, they whipped out pistols and opened fire on Gogi. The courtroom erupted in chaos as bullets flew. Gogi was hit multiple times, and the police responded with retaliatory fire, killing the assailants on the spot. But who were these assassins, and why did they target Gogi? The plot thickens as we uncover the masterminds behind this audacious crime. Gogi's arch-rival allegedly orchestrated the assassination of Sunil Mann, also known as Tilu Tadjik. Tajpariah. Tajpariah, who was already in jail for another offense, was questioned as the prime conspirator. The plot to kill Gogi was hatched in Delhi's Mandalay jail, involving eight people. Initially, the plan was to kill Gogi in a court in Panipat, Haryana. However, when the gangsters learned that Gogi would be produced in Rohini a week earlier, they decided to strike in Delhi. Sunil Mann, once a friend of Gogi and now a member of Tajpariah's gang, was a co-accused in a decade-old attempt to murder case in Alipur. Both Mann and Gogi were supposed to be present in the same courtroom on September 24. Investigators believe Mann may have tipped off Taj Perea about the court visit, allowing him to plot Gogi's assassination. While that was a weird place to get killed by rivals, this next gangster is about to push his luck in court. Siale Angilao Siale Angilao, a 25-year-old member of the Tongan Crip Gang, was on trial for charges including assault, conspiracy, robbery, and weapons offenses. This was a high-stakes trial, the culmination of a major case involving 17 Tongan Crip members. Angilao was the last defendant to stand trial, with previous defendants already sentenced to 10 to 30 years in prison. Angilao sat beside his attorney, seemingly calm, but beneath the surface, a storm was brewing. During the witness testimony, Angilao made a sudden and shocking move. He rose from his seat, grabbed his lawyer's pen, and sprinted towards the witness stand. The courtroom erupted in chaos as someone yelled, Whoa! 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 Angelao leaped with his right arm cocked overhead, pen in hand, aiming to strike a shackled witness who barely managed to dodge the attack. In a split second, the scene turned deadly. As Angelao fell feet first over the front of the witness stand, an unidentified U.S. Marshal reacted with lightning speed. The Marshal fired four shots at close range, hitting Angelao. A bailiff quickly moved to block the entrance to the front of the 
the courtroom, pointing at people in the gallery and instructing them to stay still, his right hand on his holstered weapon. Get on the ground, someone yelled in Angelao's direction. Drop the pen, drop the pen out of your hand, shouted an officer standing over Angelao. Former US attorney Brett Tolman later revealed that Angelao had assured the judge he would behave, which is why he wasn't shackled. When you have a jury, you always want the defendant to appear like he is in regular, you know, civilian clothes, that he's not in handcuffs, that he has a fair shot at being treated fairly by the justice system, Tolman explained. Angelao certainly did not expect the consequence of pushing his luck too far. However, this next man even proved how far people would go just to escape the weight of the law. Larry Darnell, Gordon Larry Darnell Gordon, a 44-year-old man, was no stranger to the law. With a criminal record spanning over 25 years, his past included federal convictions for possession of pipe bombs and a larceny conviction in 2013. But his most heinous crimes were yet to come. Gordon was facing life in prison on charges that included kidnapping, drugging, and raping a 17-year-old girl. Authorities said he had held the girl against her will for about two weeks, giving her methamphetamine and assaulting her sexually and physically. He even recorded these horrific acts on video. On a fateful Monday, Gordon was being escorted from his holding cell to a hearing at the Berrien County Courthouse in St. Joseph. He was in court to have a misdemeanor domestic violence charge dismissed in place of 17 felony counts related to the teenager's case. As Gordon was being led to the courtroom, he managed to grab a gun from a sheriff's deputy. Sheriff Paul Bailey initially stated that Gordon wasn't handcuffed, but later clarified that Gordon was indeed in cuffs, though they were in front of his body. This allowed him to seize the deputy's gun and unleash his deadly attack. In a matter of moments, chaos erupted. Gordon shot and killed two veteran bailiffs, one of whom was the courthouse's head of security. He also shot a sheriff's deputy, James Atterbury Jr., and a civilian, both of whom were injured but survived. The scene was one of utter pandemonium as other bailiffs and law enforcement officers quickly converged. Gordon briefly tried to take hostages, but the officers acted swiftly. They shot and killed Gordon, ending his deadly rampage. While that was a really weird way to avoid justice, this next man seems to have a knack for stabbing people to death. David Paradiso David Paradiso's trial for the murder of his girlfriend, Eileen Pelt, was already a high-profile case that had captured public attention. Paradiso, 28 years old, was accused of a heinous crime. He allegedly stabbed Eileen in the neck while his mother, Deborah Paradiso, drove them in her car. The gruesome details didn't end there. David forced his mother to drive to Amador County, where he disposed of Eileen's body. This chilling crime led to his arrest and the subsequent trial that would end in a shocking and violent manner. On March 4, 2009, the courtroom in Stockton was tense. David Paradiso was on the witness stand, testifying around 2 p.m. His mother, visibly upset, left the courtroom, unable to bear the proceedings. Judge Cinder Fox, who was presiding over the trial, called for a recess. As the jurors began to file out, what happened next was both unexpected and horrifying. David Paradiso, who had been relatively calm during his testimony, suddenly left the witness stand. He approached Judge Fox from behind with an unknown cutting instrument. Witnesses reported seeing Paradiso lift the judge and begin punching and possibly stabbing her. Lodi police detective Eric Bradley, an eight-year veteran and the lead investigator on Paradiso's case, was present in the courtroom. Seeing the attack unfold, Bradley drew his weapon and shot Paradiso, killing him instantly. The detective's quick response likely saved Judge Fox's life, but it also raised immediate questions about courtroom security and how Paradiso had managed to smuggle a weapon into the courtroom. Now we know that we would not have the opportunity to stab anyone again. This next killer attacked the judge who presided over the case of his rapist son out of spite. Nathaniel Richmond on a seemingly ordinary Monday morning in August 2017, the quiet town of Steubenville, Ohio, was rocked by a shocking and violent event. Jefferson County Judge Joseph Bruzzisi Jr. was ambushed and shot outside the county courthouse. The assailant was Nathaniel Nate Richmond, a name already known to the community due to his son's infamous r conviction. Nathaniel Richmond's son, Malik Richmond, was a high school football player convicted in 2013 of raping a 16-year-old girl during an alcohol-fueled party in 2012. The trial and subsequent conviction of Malik Richmond and another Steubenville High School football player led to allegations of a cover-up to protect the football team. Fast forward to 2017 and the Richmond family was once again in the headlines, but this time for an even more tragic reason. On that fateful Monday, Judge Joseph Bruzzisi Jr. was walking towards the courthouse when Nathaniel Richmond ambushed him. The attack was caught on courthouse video, showing both men exchanging gunfire. Richmond managed to shoot the judge, but Bruzzisi, known for his resilience and toughness, 
toughness, fought back. The judge was eventually shoved to the ground during the attack. Steubenville city manager James Mavramatis reported that Bruzisi was talking after being wounded and was quickly flown to a Pittsburgh area hospital. Ohio Governor John Kasich later confirmed that the judge would survive the attack, much to the relief of the community. But what could have driven Nathaniel Richmond to commit such a brazen act? Investigators are still searching for a motive and have not found a direct connection to the case involving his son. Instead, records show that Judge Brzezzi was overseeing a wrongful death lawsuit that Richmond had filed in April against the Jefferson County Metropolitan Housing Authority. Safe to say that the apple does not really fall far from the tree. This next killer is about to lose his mind in court. Shondall Jackson the Milwaukee County Circuit courtroom was packed, tension thick in the air as everyone awaited the sentencing of Shondell Jackson. This 19-year-old had been convicted of the brutal murder of University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee film student Nathan Potter. The crime had shocked the community, and now justice was about to be served. Milwaukee County Circuit Judge Rebecca Dallet presided over the case. As she prepared to deliver the sentence, the atmosphere was electric. Jackson's attorney, Patrick Earle, made a final plea, asking the judge to consider Jackson's youth and his lack of impulse control, but the gravity of Jackson's actions weighed heavily on the room. However, the judge did waste any time before sentencing him to life in prison with no chance of parole. The words hung in the air for a moment, and then all hell broke loose. Shondell Jackson erupted in a fit of rage, spitting a string of obscenities at Judge Dallet. The courtroom descended into chaos as three deputies and Milwaukee police detective James Hutchinson rushed to subdue him. Jackson fought back fiercely, and it took all their strength to wrestle him to the ground the deputies had to use pepper spray to finally bring him under control. The fumes filled the room, causing Judge Dallet's voice to become raspy as she continued with the proceedings. In the midst of the struggle, Jackson's family stood at the back of the courtroom, adding fuel to the fire. One woman screamed, I hate you, at the Potter family, while another shouted, God's the judge. The Potters, holding each other and weeping, were subjected to this verbal assault as they tried to process the day's events. While that was a really violent reaction to a life sentence, the next killer is about to experience the weight of public justice. Aku Yadav Aku Yadav, born Parat Kalicharan in the early 1970s, grew up in the Kasturba Nagar slum in Nagpur, Maharashtra. From a young age, he was involved in criminal activities, eventually becoming a feared gangster, robber, home invader, kidnapper, serial rapist, murderer, and extortionist. Over the years, he and his gang committed numerous heinous acts, including rape, murder, home invasion, and extortion. He extorted money from the residents of Kasturba Nagar, threatening and harming those who resisted. Yadav murdered at least three individuals and raped over 40 women and girls, some as young as 10 years old. He bribed the police, who not only turned a blind eye to his crimes, but also supported him. The turning point came when a woman named Usha Narayane stood up against Aku and his gang. After she resisted their threats, a mob of angry residents burned down his house. Fearing for his life, Aku went to the police for protection and was arrested on August 7, 2004. However, this was not the end of his story. On August 13, 2004, Aku Yadav was scheduled for a bail hearing at the Nagpur District Court. Word spread that he might be released, and hundreds of women from the slum, armed with vegetable knives and chili powder, marched to the courthouse. They were determined to ensure that Aku would never terrorize them again. As Aku walked into the courtroom, he was confident and unrepentant. He mocked one of his victims, calling her a prostitute and threatening to rape her again. This was the final straw. The woman started hitting him on the head with her footwear, and soon, the mob of 200 to 400 women attacked him. They stabbed him at least 70 times, threw chili powder and stones in his face, and one of his alleged victims even hacked off his penis. The police officers, overwhelmed and terrified, fled the scene. While that was a befitting punishment for a criminal who thought he was above the law, this next murderer took things even farther to escape the consequences of his actions. Brian Nichols. On March 11, 2005, the Fulton County Courthouse in Atlanta, Georgia, became the scene of a horrifying killing spree. Brian Nichols, who was on trial for rape, managed to overpower Sheriff Deputy Cynthia Hall while she was changing his clothes. He stole her Glock service pistol and brutally beat her into a coma. Nichols had previously attempted to sneak Shanks into the courtroom via his shoes, indicating his premeditated intent to escape. After changing into civilian clothes, Nichols encountered case managers Susan Christie and Gina Clark Thomas, along with attorney David 
David Allman. Holding them at gunpoint, he demanded they lead him to Judge Roland Barnes's chambers. Sergeant Grantley White attempted to disarm Nichols, but failed and was forced to handcuff the others. White set off an alarm, which Nichols tried to dispel using White's radio. Nichols then progressed into the courtroom, where he fatally shot Judge Barnes and court reporter Julie Ann Brandau. As he made his escape from the courthouse, Nichols also fatally shot Sergeant Hoyt Teasley. Nichols stole several vehicles during his flight and was featured on America's Most Wanted as the manhunt intensified. A reward of $65,000 was announced for information leading to his arrest. Nichols attempted to kidnap a young woman walking home from a gym, but fled after her boyfriend defended her and she called 911. Later that day, Nichols fatally shot ICE Special Agent David G. Wilhelm, stealing his badge, gun, and pickup truck. The manhunt for Nichols lasted 26 hours and spanned the metropolitan Atlanta area. The turning point came when police received a 911 call from Ashley Smith, a young woman who said Nichols was at her Duluth, Georgia apartment. Law enforcement responded, and Nichols surrendered without further violence. Authorities recovered several stolen firearms and Special Agent Wilhelm's wallet. The stolen truck was found about two miles from Smith's apartment. Smith's account of her ordeal with Nichols is nothing short of extraordinary. She told police that Nichols had forced his way into her apartment on March 12th and held her hostage at gunpoint for seven hours. During this time, she gave Nichols methamphetamine and read portions of The Purpose Driven Life to him. She tried to convince Nichols to turn himself in by sharing her own tragic story, including her husband's death and a scar from a car wreck while under the influence of drugs. After making him pancakes for breakfast, Nichols allowed Smith to leave to see her daughter, whereupon she called the police. Smith received reward money for her assistance in Nichols' capture. The next killer is one who had the police department working hard for over 30 years before they could capture him. Ted Bundy Ted Bundy, born in 1946, had a troubled childhood, with his mother pretending to be his sister and his grandparents raising him as their own. This complex family dynamic laid the foundation for Bundy's future behavior. Despite his unsettling beginnings, Bundy appeared to lead a normal life in the late 1960s, attending college in Washington, engaging in politics, and maintaining relationships with women like Diane Edwards and Elizabeth Klopfer. In 1974, Bundy's darker side emerged as young women began disappearing in the Pacific Northwest. Bundy lured his victims by feigning injury or posing as an authority figure, then abducted, assaulted, and murdered them. His crimes spread fear across multiple states, with witnesses often describing a man with a cast driving a tan Volkswagen Beetle. After moving to Salt Lake City, Bundy continued his spree, eventually being arrested in 1975 with suspicious items found in his car, leading to his first conviction. Bundy's criminal activities escalated, and after two successful escapes from custody, he resurfaced in Florida. In January 1978, he committed brutal attacks at Florida State University's Chi Omega sorority house, killing two women. He also abducted and murdered a 12-year-old girl, Kimberly Leach, shortly after. These crimes led to his eventual capture, trial, and conviction, where he sabotaged his own defense and refused plea deals, resulting in a death sentence. Ted Bundy's reign of terror ended with his execution in 1989, but not before he confessed to his crimes, revealing the full extent of his brutality, including acts of necrophilia. His story remains one of the most chilling examples of a serial killer who hid his true nature behind a facade of charm and normalcy, leaving a lasting impact on the nation's collective memory. Justice delayed is definitely not justice denied. This next gangster also would have never imagined that he will meet his end in a place where justice is supposed to be upheld. Sanjeev Jeeva the courtroom in Lucknow, Uttar Pradesh, was the scene of a shocking and brutal crime on June 7, 2023. Sanjeev Maheshwari, better known as Jeeva, a notorious gangster with a long history of criminal activities, was attending a hearing for a case in which he was an accused. What unfolded next was a scene straight out of a crime thriller. Dressed as lawyers, the attackers managed to infiltrate the courtroom. As Maheshwari sat there, unaware of the impending danger, the assailants opened fire. The courtroom erupted into chaos as bullets flew, injuring an infant and two police officers who were nearby. The attackers showed no mercy, and Maheshwari was hit multiple times. The scene was one of utter pandemonium, with people scrambling for cover and the sound of gunfire echoing through the halls. According to a statement from King George's Medical University, Lucknow, the post-mortem report of Sanjeev Maheshwari revealed 16 bullet entry and exit points in his body. Eight bullets were fired, with six hitting his chest and two his hands. Forensic experts speculate that in a reflex action, Maheshwari put his hands on his chest, causing the bullets to penetrate them. The bullets that hit the police officers
Jesus and the infant passed through Maheshwari's body, which is why they weren't fatal. The alleged killer, identified as Vijay Yadav, was apprehended and is set to be sent to Lucknow jail after his release from the hospital. Moving on, the next case is about to reject his court sentencing in the most surprising way possible. Slobodan Praljak in 1991, Slobodan Praljak voluntarily joined the newly formed Croatian Armed Forces, quickly rising through the ranks to become a major general by April 1992. Praljak's military career was marked by his involvement in several key conflicts, including the Croatian War of Independence, the Bosnian War, and the Croat-Bosniak War. Despite his military achievements, Praljak's actions during the Croat-Bosniak War would later lead to his downfall. He was accused of failing to prevent his forces from committing numerous war crimes crimes, including the unlawful deportation and confinement of civilians, inhuman treatment, and the destruction of property. One of the most infamous acts attributed to him was the destruction of Mostar's Stari Most, a historic bridge, in November 1993. In 2004, Praljak voluntarily surrendered to the ICTY, where he faced charges of committing violations of the laws of war, crimes against humanity, and breaches of the Geneva Conventions. The trial began on April 26, 2006, and on May 29, 2013, the trial chamber sentenced him to 20 years of imprisonment. Praljak immediately filed an appeal, maintaining his innocence and rejecting the court's verdict. As the years passed, Praljak continued to fight against his conviction. He chose to defend himself without a lawyer. On the day of the final verdict, the atmosphere in the courtroom was tense. Praljak, dressed in a suit, stood before the judges as they delivered their decision. As the guilty verdict was upheld, Praljak's face remained stoic. He then addressed the judges, saying, Judges, Slobodan Praljak is not a war criminal. With disdain, I reject your verdict. In a shocking turn of events, he then reached into his pocket, pulled out a small vial, and drank its contents. The courtroom erupted in chaos as Praljak collapsed. Medical staff rushed to his aid, but it was too late. Praljak was transported to a nearby hospital where he was pronounced dead. The poison he had ingested was later identified as potassium cyanide, a deadly substance that caused heart failure. Just like Praljak went out with a bang, this next millionaire turned and arsonist is about to reject his sentence in the same way. Michael Marin Michael James. Marin was a man of many talents and ambitions. He was an American financier, lawyer, ex-Wall Street trader, and millionaire. However, behind the facade of success and adventure, there were cracks in Marin's seemingly perfect life. In 2012, Marin's world came crashing down. He was accused of arson and insurance fraud for allegedly setting his own home on fire. The charges were serious, and if convicted, Marin faced 7 to 21 years in prison. The court hearings began on May 21, 2012, and the case quickly became a media sensation. The public was captivated by the fall of a man who had once been at the pinnacle of success. As the trial progressed, the evidence against Marin mounted. Prosecutors painted a picture of a man who was desperate to escape financial ruin. They argued that Marin had set his home on fire in a bid to collect insurance money. On June 28, 2012, the jury returned with a guilty verdict. Marin was found guilty of arson and insurance fraud. The courtroom was tense as the verdict was read. Marin, who had been stoic throughout the trial, closed his eyes and put his hands over his face. What happened next was something no one could have anticipated. In a shocking turn of events, Marin put something in his mouth and drank a liquid. Moments later, he fell to the floor and began to convulse. The courtroom erupted in chaos as people realized what was happening. Marin was rushed to a central hospital in Phoenix, but it was too late. He was pronounced dead. An autopsy later confirmed that he had taken a lethal dose of cyanide. While that was a really surprising way to escape financial problems, this next mother is about to face very harsh consequences, the same way she subjected her son to very terrible living conditions till he died. Cheyenne Harris on August 30th, 2017, the lifeless body of Cheyenne Harris's four-month-old son, Sterling Kane, was discovered in their apartment in Alta Vista, a small city in northeast Iowa. The conditions in which Sterling was found were beyond appalling and revealed a level of neglect that is almost unimaginable. Sterling was found in a mechanical swing weighing less than seven pounds. His diaper was infested with maggots and feces had eaten through his skin, leading to a severe E. coli infection. The room where he was found was hot, attracting flies that laid eggs, which hatched into maggots while Sterling was still alive. Prosecutors revealed that the baby had been left in the same diaper for 9 to 14 days. The forensic entomologist's testimony painted a grim picture of the neglect Sterling endured in his final days. Harris admitted during an interview with Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation agent Chris Calloway that she should have checked on her son more often. She also revealed that she had been suffering from postpartum depression and had been self-medicating. However, prosecutors argued that this 
this was no excuse for the extreme neglect that led to Sterling's death. The baby's father, Zachary Cohn, was also found guilty of the same charges in November. He had called 911 on the day Sterling was found, falsely claiming that the baby had died of sudden infant death syndrome. A babysitter who had cared for Sterling testified that the infant had a raw diaper rash and seemed underweight but ate hungrily when fed. She recounted how Harris had left Sterling and a two-year-old girl with her for 17 hours the first time she babysat. Harris was convicted of first-degree murder and child endangerment resulting in death. She was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. While that was a very brutal and saddening condition for a little baby, this next killer had the police seeking the help of Ted Bundy, the famous serial killer, to unravel the evil that he wrought. Gary Ridgway Gary Ridgway's journey to becoming one of America's most notorious serial killers, the Green River Killer, is a chilling story that spans decades. Let's look into the timeline and key events that led to his life sentence for 48 murders. Ridgway's first known victim was Wendy Lee Caulfield, whose body was discovered in the Green River in July 1982. This marked the beginning of a series of murders that would terrorize the Seattle and Tacoma areas for nearly two decades. Ridgway targeted vulnerable women, primarily sex workers and runaways, luring them with a picture of his son to gain their trust before strangling them. Despite being a suspect in the Green River murders since 1982, Ridgway managed to evade capture for nearly two decades. In 1983, the Green River Task Force was formed to investigate the murders. Investigators even sought advice from incarcerated serial killer Ted Bundy, who provided insights into the mind of the killer. However, Ridgway continued his killing spree, his kill rate only decreasing when he began dating Judith Mawson in 1985. They married in 1988, and Mawson later claimed that Ridgway had wrapped a body in a carpet in their house. She suspected he committed some of the murders while supposedly working early morning shifts. In 1984, Ridgway passed a polygraph test, further complicating the investigation. It wasn't until advances in DNA profiling in the early 2000s that investigators could definitively link him to the murders. In 2001, Ridgway was finally arrested after DNA evidence connected him to the deaths of four women. In 2003, Ridgway entered a guilty plea to 48 charges of aggravated first-degree murder as part of a plea bargain that spared him the death penalty. Attorney Norm Maleng explained that the deal was made to ensure Ridgway's cooperation in locating the remains of his victims and providing closure to their families. Ridgway was sentenced to 48 life sentences without parole, plus an additional 10 years for each of his 48 victims. He later received another life sentence after the remains of his 49th victim were found. Moving on, the next case is one that will shock you because of how far people will go to escape the weight of the law, even if it means committing more crimes. Michael Brady the story of Michael Brady's sentencing is one of the most shocking and gruesome tales in recent history. On October 28, 2019, a Dare County jury took less than an hour to recommend the death penalty for Michael Edward Brady II. This decision came after Brady admitted to being the mastermind behind a meticulously planned and executed escape attempt at Pasquo Tank Correctional Institute in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. This escape attempt, which took place in October 2017, turned into the deadliest prison escape in North Carolina's history. For several months, Brady and three other inmates, Wyzeza Buckman, Seth Frazier, and Jonathan Monk, planned their escape. They trained rigorously, prepared backpacks, and assembled supplies and weapons. The plan was detailed and methodical, but it ended in a bloodbath that left four prison employees dead. The victims were sewing plant manager Veronica Darden, maintenance worker Jeffrey Howe, and correctional officers Justin Smith and Wendy Shannon. During the trial, Brady took the stand and provided chilling details about the escape. He described how each victim was stabbed and beaten to death, stating that he had to do whatever it took to escape. His calm demeanor as he recounted the gruesome events sent shivers down the spines of everyone in the courtroom. The jury found Brady guilty of four counts of first-degree murder and ten other charges related to the escape attempt after just 35 minutes of deliberation. Superior Court Judge Jerry Tillett read the jury's recommendation and confirmed that Brady would be sentenced to death for each of the four counts of murder. Michael Jones Diana Duve, a 26-year-old nurse, was reported missing after a night out with her on-and-off boyfriend, Michael Jones. The couple had been seen together at a bar in Vero Beach, Florida, but what started as a seemingly normal evening quickly turned into a nightmare. Diana's friends and family grew increasingly worried when she didn't return home. 
Their worst fears were confirmed when Diana's body was discovered in the trunk of her car at a Melbourne shopping centre. The discovery was made two days after she was last seen alive, and the details of her murder were nothing short of horrifying. Michael Jones, who had a history of violence and a prior conviction for aggravated stalking, quickly became the prime suspect. He was arrested at a Fort Pierce hotel, still on probation for his previous conviction. Medical examiner Dr. Roger Mittelman testified that Diana's murder was a painful death as breathing and blood flow stopped while she was choked. He described it as a desperate, horrible struggle by the victim to try and survive. His former girlfriend testified that Jones had transformed from a nice guy to a controlling bully who threatened to get her fired and even kill her. The jury heard a chilling 911 call where Jones threatened, the moment you step out your door, there will be a bullet in your head, then I will kill myself. She had obtained a restraining order and Jones was arrested. In the end, the jury decided on a life sentence for Michael Jones. Moving on, the next case will prove how far people can go to achieve their aim, even if it means taking the life of a close childhood friend. Austin Myers on January 28, 18-year-old Justin Michael Back, a recent high school graduate set to join the Navy, was brutally murdered in his own home by Austin Gregory Myers and Timothy E. Mosley, former childhood friends. Myers, born in 1995, and Mosley, born in 1994, reconnected with a sinister plan to steal a safe from Justin's home, believing it contained $20,000. The safe belonged to Justin's stepfather, Mark Cates, and was thought to hold money and a gun. That morning, Myers and Mosley purchased supplies including materials to fashion a garrote, intending to strangle Justin. When the plan went awry, Mosley panicked and stabbed Justin repeatedly while Myers assisted in the attack, resulting in Justin being stabbed 21 times. After the murder, they ransacked the house, taking the safe, jewelry, and other items before attempting to clean the crime scene. They drove Justin's body to a remote area in Preble County, where they tried to dispose of it by pouring chemicals on it and shooting it with a stolen gun. Afterward, they returned to Mosley's house, House, where they discovered the safe contained only paperwork and loose change. They burned evidence in a fire pit and disposed of the safe in a river. When Mark Cates returned home, he discovered the burglary and called the police. The investigation quickly led to Myers, whose car was identified by witnesses. After initial denials, Myers confessed following Mosley's admission of their crime. Justin's body was found later that day, and both Myers and Mosley were arrested and eventually sentenced for the brutal and calculated murder. While that was a case of betrayal and murder, the next serial killer wanted to become the next big thing, and he chose to become popular by shooting up his high school. Nicholas Cruz on February 14, 2018, Nicholas Cruz walked into Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, and opened fire. The carnage left 17 people dead and 17 others wounded, marking it as the deadliest high school shooting in United States history. Cruz legally purchased an AR-15 style semi-automatic rifle and carried out his deadly plan. Cruz was arrested approximately one hour and 20 minutes after the shooting. In 2018, he was charged with 17 counts of premeditated murder and held without bond after confessing to the shooting. He was placed on suicide watch in solitary confinement. Cruz's trial faced multiple delays, first to allow his lawyers more time to build their case, and then due to the COVID-19 pandemic. At 2021, Cruz pled guilty to all charges, including murder and attempted murder, expressing remorse for his crimes. He was also sentenced to 26 years in prison for an assault charge. In 2022, Cruz's death penalty trial began and the jury recommended a sentence of life, imprisonment without parole. This verdict was met with anger and disappointment from the victim's families, who had hoped for the death penalty. The next case is almost comical, as this murderer blew up after hearing his sentencing and spilled his feces on the court attendees. Ricky Hand Ricky Hand's criminal history is extensive. Over the years, he committed at least 30 robberies, terrorizing communities, and leaving a trail of fear in his wake. His last crime in January 2016 was the final straw, leading to his arrest and subsequent trial. The judge's decision to sentence him to 40 years was meant to ensure that Hand would no longer pose a threat to society. Hand's reaction was immediate and explosive. He turned to the judge and asked, Did you just give me 40 years, sir? You just gave me 40 years. Well, guess what? With those words, he reached under his arm, pulling out pill bottles filled with feces and urine, which he had hidden in an arm sling. Chaos erupted as Hand began hurling the contents around the courtroom. The stench and shock left everyone momentarily paralyzed. Courtroom officials quickly sprang into action, restraining Hand and trying to restore order amidst the pandemonium. Clark County Sheriff Gene Kelly later revealed that Hand had managed to smuggle the pill bottles into the courtroom, a clear violation of security protocols. This man should have been more thoroughly searched prior 
prior to entering the courtroom. Our policy dictates that there's a search prior to, and there's a search after he leaves, and that was very apparently not done, said Sheriff Kelly. The courtroom incident has sparked an investigation by the sheriff's office, and Hand could now face a new felony charge for his outrageous behavior. The shocking nature of this event has left many questioning how such a lapse in security could have occurred. Click on one of the cards on your screen to see more videos like this.